there's no better moment for me on a set than when you know our, our key grip comes up to me in the morning and uh, and shakes my hand, looks me in the eye, and goes, "Yeah, let's do it." Goes, yeah, yeah, Mike, let's do it, baby. Mike Anderson, hey, let's roll. You know, that's it. Basquiat uh, was not my first role on film, but it was my first lead. I had literally just put in my letter of resignation <laughs> from Angels in America on Broadway. I'd been doing it for about a year and a half, and he came back home, and there was a message. It was from a friend of mine named Randy Sabusawa, who had been a producer for Abel Ferrara and other things, and he said, Jeffrey, I'm, I'm, I'm helping uh, casting uh, folks find someone to play Jean-Michel Basquiat, and I thought of you, and I uh, just wanted to give you the heads up, you know, give me a call, let me know what you think. And I heard that message, and I immediately knew that that was the next thing that I was going to do. Hey, Benny, man, how long do you think it takes to get famous? For a musician? Mm. Or a painter? Whatever, f famous. Four years? They asked me to come in and read Benny, to read uh, the role that Benicio Del Toro ultimately played. And I'm like, huh? So we went down to Julian uh, Schnabel's house, who directed it, but I took it upon myself to read Benny's role as I would read Jean-Michel Basquiat. And the next day, or I think it was even sh like after I got home from that read, Julian called me and asked me if I would uh, consider playing that role. And away we went. Ride with the Devil. So this was after I'd done Basquiat, and my agent called and said, Ang Lee wants to meet with you, Ang Lee and James Seamus. They don't want to send the script, uh, but they have this Civil War film. You know my name? It's Hope. Nah. My whole name. So I went over to their office over on Canal Street, and we sat down and talked. And I realized the reason that they didn't want to send the script is because they thought it might be misperceived. It was a story, a Civil War story, but told um, from the perspective of the South, set during the Kansas-Missouri border war, which was kind of an irregular war on the outskirts of the boundaries of our country at that point and on the boundaries of this war. It was the place where a lot of the outlaws of the Old West made their names. Um, Jesse James, uh, Wild Bill Hickok, all of these type uh, folks were involved in this. Anyway, I played a role that was based on a real character named Nolan, if I'm not mistaken, who was a scout uh, for Quantrill who raided Lawrence, Kansas. He was a, a, a commander of the Southern forces over there. Pretty controversial guy. Uh, but my character, Daniel Holt, is fighting on the side of the Confederacy uh, not because he has allegiance to the principles of slavery and the principles of uh, uh, the free South, but because he had personal relationships with folks who were involved in the war, a guy that he grew up with. Uh, his family was attacked, and, and Holt goes out and tries to, to fight on behalf of his friend and winds up getting caught. And now he's riding with the devil. And what I loved about the story was that it was a story about our history, about uh, racial dynamics within our history. It was a story about slavery and emancipation, but from Holt's perspective, it was a story about his own emancipation. It was not a story about the great white savior uh, rescuing him from his burden, from his shackles. It was about him having to navigate his way through a very nuanced and complex reality and emerge out of it whole, fully human and free. And um, it's one of my favorite films that I've done. It's a beautiful film. Um, I encourage you to check it out. Last film of the 20th century about the American Civil War, but told from the perspective of Ang Lee in a kind of de Tocqueville way you know, outsider looking in and shining some very interesting and, um, and uh, probing light on the subject. Shaft. P.
People love peoples. He's a man of the peoples. Peoples. People like the bad guys, i found. It's an interesting dynamic. They dig the bad guys. He certainly was that. Stay still, please. Yo, chef, I'm gonna put so many lawyers in your ass, you're gonna think they open a branch office up there. Lawyers? Lawyers are for punietas. I thought you were gonna smoke me. I smoke gum. Peoples is Dominican. Born in the Dominican Republic, came to the States at some point. Lives up in Washington Heights. So I went on journeys up there. But there was one individual in particular who really influenced me. I used to go to a place in Midtown, particularly when I was doing shows on Broadway. It's called the Lone Star Boat Club. It was an old men's club where Walter Matthau, Ed Sullivan, all of these guys used to go. There was a guy who managed the whole place named Raphael, Rafi. Rafi was Dominican. And because I used to come to the club late, Rafi would say to me, for example, he'd say, Jerry, he said, you, you, you turning into a vampire, you know, like Dracula with the fangs. You, you, why, why are you always late? <laughs> he said, you know, you're like a vampire, <laughs> like Dracula. Five family, five borough, one law. So Rafi was the clarion bell for peoples. He was the one who gave me the voice. And in fact, when I got the script, I said, Rafi, here, man, would you read, you know, a couple of these lines? Read uh, this, you know, and he, he came over and I recorded him. So I owe, uh, I owe Rafi much of, uh, of people's language and voice. Boycott. Got a call from Clark Johnson that I want you to play King. And I'm like, really? I was like, oh, wow. And, I, you know, in fact, the first thing I said was like, you know, <clears throat> King's, uh, you know, we're a different, you know, shade of, of uh, a brother, you know. And I thought I might be a little lighter uh, than what was required, although I'm blue-black in my brain. But Clark said that we were going to do this uh, not based on the color of skin, but on the content of character. So I was like, oh, well, you know, I can't argue with you. I was like, That's, you know, touche. So I agreed to do it, and I stayed in the sun as much as I possibly could to do at least that part uh, as much justice as possible. Good morning, Reverend King, Mrs. King. Good morning. Very good morning. Went down to, uh, to Atlanta to film that, and it was interesting doing Mark Antony just before doing that film, because of course, you know, Mark Antony uh, is, is known for his famous oration in Caesar. And there has been no greater orator in the history of our country than Martin Luther King. So it was actually um, an interesting uh, warm-up rehearsal process for that role. What I found, however, was I was just overwhelmed by an appreciation for the capacity of his breath to be able to deliver those speeches, often impromptu, in the way that he did with such force, such power. The first sin I have committed is being born a Negro. The second sin I have committed, along with all of us, is to object to the twin battering rams of segregation and oppression. The breath required was exhausting, but we went at it, and I had been rehearsing that role since I could remember in some ways, because I was always just in love with who he was, with his voice, with his uh, words, with his writing. I was taught in 10th grade by one of my favorite uh, uh, teachers in high school, Dr. Paul Piazza. He would teach us uh, with King about repetition and alliteration and imagery and all of these things. So yeah, I just threw myself into that. Plus, I was really trying to impress my co-star, who's playing Coretta, Scott King, Carmen Ujogo. Um, so, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was at 125 miles an hour. I was on it um, because, uh, of course, she later became um, the mother of my children and my wife. Angels in America. Ten years exactly after um, 
I started with the production on Broadway, year and a half on Broadway, seven hour play. Knew that piece pretty well <laughs> by the time we came uh, to film it. There was a difference only in that it was on film. Um, so the performance is told through an aperture as opposed to through a proscenium stage to 800 people or however many people we had at Walter Kerr any given night. It's a more distilled performance, quieter at times. Also, my hair was different. <laughs> um, and of course, playing with a different set of actors. I had the good fortune to be the only one from the Broadway production that was in the film. Boy, what kind of homosexual are you anyway? That's not Purple Mary. That color up there is mauve. Al Pacino as uh, the dreaded Roy Cohn and Meryl Streep, Emma Thompson, Ben uh, Shankman, and uh, just a wonderful gathering of folks, Mike Nichols directing. Whereas Ron Liebman, the late, recently late Ron Liebman, beautiful, extraordinary, powerful, crazy, ironic, wonderful, horrible, brilliant performance of his, by, uh, of, of Roy Cohn, but then playing with uh, Al Pacino, who is all those things as well. I never saw that coming. You kill me! Get somewhere you can take off that shirt and throw it out and don't touch the blood. Well, I, why? I don't understand. Ow! I, I... Ow! I already gave you my blessing! What more do you want from me? Get the f*** out of here! That piece is, is kind of the center of my career. Or it's the epicenter, anyway. It's where, it's where it all begins, with that experience on Broadway and then continuing into the film. I owe Tony Kushner and uh, George Wolfe, who directed the play, I owe them a lot in terms of what I am as a creative person and what I am as a, as a human being. Maybe one of the most human uh, pieces that uh, will ever be written. Bond. James Bond. I got a call and my agent said, yeah, they want you to do the James Bond movie. Uh, they, you know, they're going to send over the script. Barbara Broccoli called and, you know, they're saying like some CIA guy or something. So, you know, take a look at it when you get it. So the script arrives. I'm like, bro, <laughs> what do you mean some CIA guy? That's Felix Leiter, man. What? Yeah, I'll do that. But of course, originally played by Jack Lord, you know, from Hawaii Five-0 in the shades and everything. Sean Connery. Funny game, right? Sorry, I should have introduced myself, seeing as we're related. Felix Leiter, a brother from Langley. You should have a little faith. You keep your head about you, I think you have him. The way that I kind of thought about him was in some ways in relationship to what Daniel was doing. He was bringing a different level of authenticity to his bond. Uh, a guy that you could kind of picture, yeah, I can actually picture that guy in the back alley, like getting down, you know, he had kind of an edge to him. And so I wanted to um, make sure that Felix has to be um, kind of grounded, you know, and a guy that you could picture like creeping in the shadows. One of those guys, you know, not, you know, kind of like a diplomatic type uh, level guy, but an underbelly guy, you know, who can handle himself and do it, you know, with my own flavor. OG. OG is a film like no other I've been a part of. Not because of me so much as because of my co-stars, my colleagues, my fellow actors, who are all men incarcerated, most of them still incarcerated as we speak. And so they were mentors to me through this process. They were uh, expert consultants <laughs> throughout this thing. They were colleagues. They were incredibly supportive, incredibly engaged in the process. Theotis Carter, who plays uh, Beecher, who I have most of the screen, screen time with, was the most intense individual actor I've ever uh, shared the space with. No one 
comes close. No one else. And I've worked with the greats. <clears throat> he had such a profoundly deep reservoir of emotion. They all did. When they laughed, the laughter would come from deep within them and kind of things would just reverberate. When he got angry, it was anger. And he did a couple of times with me. You got to pay rent. You. I said United need rent, 10 a week. But Terry sent you? Hey, I'm not your man, young blood. Not easy giving a performance. It's tedious. It's long hours. <laughs> They've got a lot of time, yes. But we were, you know, 14, sometimes 16 hours a day working on this. It's repetitive. It's specific. Your understanding of it evolves over time and the tools that you need to be able to shape it and all that. And he just absorbed and he wanted it so badly. And he does a wonderful job. And he said this very specifically in what he might have done if he had had an opportunity like that prior to being inside uh, Pendleton, Pendleton Correctional Facility uh, outside Indianapolis, Indiana. His story was very much like the stories of many, all of the men, almost universally, whether they be white, because we was a pretty uh, even split there and that we were in Indiana, you had rural poor, rural disadvantage, you had urban disadvantage, and they had a shared story of uh, instability at childhood, of absence of opportunity, of drug use, of parental abuse or neglect, and an utter chaos and incarceration. But prior to incarceration, some pretty heinous crimes. But at the same time, uh, some of them are working toward a very difficult redemption inside. And this film, we hope to be part of that in some way. The thing about those guys is they know their stories. And if politicians, the legislators, took time to really understand those guys, to go to prison, talk to them, we could shape change in this country relative to violence and criminality and incarceration in a way that would be unbelievably transformative and positive and productive for all of us. We could create a safer, less violent society by listening to them, how they got there. You know, you don't have to like them, but they certainly can tell you um, uh, how they went wrong and how society went wrong in, in creating them. Boardwalk Empire. People do like bad guys, they're drawn to bad guys, but I wanted to make him so villainous that he was just absolutely loathsome. Because he's just so hypocritical and, and so um, actively works with enthusiasm and delight to betray everything that he pretends to hold so dear. We have no quarrel. Mr. Pernsley. How about you getting even for Dickie Pastor? That account has been settled, and in any event, it was merely financial in nature. I'm here on new business. And everything that he holds up um, as the pinnacle of citizenship, he works actively to undermine daily. And he got, I mean, you know, that's just, that's just so beautifully loathsome. So, yeah, Dr. Narcisse. Westworld. I was sent the first script again, agent, hey, Jonah Nolan wants to Skype with you, talk to you about uh, this new show. You know, Anthony Hopkins is on board, nobody else really yet, you know, you want to talk to him? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not doing anything right now. Yeah, I'll talk to Jonah Nolan. Yeah, I hadn't seen the movie Westworld before, uh, so I watched that. And then Jonah and I had a chat, and then after that, sent me the script, just the first episode. So, like, ooh, this is really something. Because the architecture of that first episode was very well considered, very specific, and played into the storytelling in a way 
that kind of indicated to me where the show might go. So I'm like, yeah, Jonah, um, count me in. I flattered myself we were taking a more disciplined approach here. I suppose self-delusion is a gift of natural selection as well. Indeed it is. I started filming, shot the pilot, and I still, you know, Lisa, you know, and Jonah, oh, Bernard's, you know, he's very understated. He's an understated guy, you know, just kind of, you know, spinning his hamster wheel, doing his thing. Detective, you know, brilliant guy, just trying to sort out, you know, all of the, you know, look after the park. Okay, great. Yeah, cool. But understated. Okay, cool. Boom. Then, you know, we got picked up to come back. So I think we came back like in May, I think, of the next year, 2015, maybe something like that. We start rehearsing and Lisa Joy calls me into her, into her office. She's like, uh, oh, Jeffrey, uh, how can I say? Uh, what is it? Oh, okay. All right. Let me tell you. You're going to need um, Bernard's a host. What? Oh. Um, okay. And so that was my little uh, secret seed kernel in my hard drive from then on that no one else knew. No one else knew. I don't think even Tony knew. No, he didn't know. Uh, Anthony Hopkins. And, and so, you know, that was Bernard. But, you know, on a journey of discovery about what is what is he what is his being what is humanity kind of discover what humanity is so that he might be able to understand himself as he tries to uh, replicate it kind of like an actor maybe <laughs> but um, that's good old Bernard yeah and we'll see where he goes from here but this year this season of course the show has taken on uh, you know a different um, tone it's a new world and it just looks new, it feels new, it looks like freshly blown glass. It's just gorgeous, man. It's just like refracting and all this stuff. We and it's a complex show, huge, sprawling, so many moving parts and hundreds of pairs of hands and brains working to get it done. It's just the collaboration. You know, the circle of, of artists uh, and uh, creative folks and carpenters and electricians, uh, all creative as well, and craftsmen who work on our show and writers coming together, uh, and actors, of course, coming together to create this world that we really haven't seen before. And to be in the center of that when the camera is on you and time to roll, and to take on that responsibility and have everybody looking around and go, okay, we're moving the ball down the field right now, let's go. And you hit it, it's just so great. It's just so great. Hi GQ, I'm Jeffrey Wright, and also wanna talk a little bit about uh, some things that are happening right now. If you are self-isolated, if you're quarantined right now, if you wanna figure out a way to, uh, to be helpful, feel uh, involved in, uh, in this fight, uh, go to uh, our GoFundMe page. Brooklyn for Life, you can Google that, or my name at GoFundMe, and contribute to our effort to feed healthcare workers here in Brooklyn uh, by raising money that goes to providing meals to five uh, Brooklyn hospitals, seven EMS stations now, all meals provided by local small biz restaurants. So every, uh, every dollar that's raised will go to those restaurants to keep them afloat so they can keep our warriors on the front line fed and supported. So show a little love. Thank you. And if you're outside, if you've, if you've passed uh, this COVID uh, phase that we're experiencing now, um, just remember, we made it and we didn't make it without the... Uh, support the hard work the dedication of the heroes on the front lines our nurses our doctors uh, all the workers in our hospitals our emts and paramedics uh, everybody on the front line bravo to them thank you all and let's carry on <laughs>